Welcome to another IEA Reporter Podcast. I'm Dave Harbison, the Communications Director of the Idaho Education Association. Our guest today is Debbie Critchfield, who serves as the co-chair of the new K-12 task force called Our Kids, Idaho's Future. And she was also recently named to the post of president of the Idaho State Board of Education. Debbie, let's start talking out uh, about the first of those two roles and your hopes and expectations for the K-12 task force, which is a follow-up to the task force convened by Governor Otter back in 2013. I think the best description I heard came from the co-chair of the committee, Bill Gilbert. He's a local businessman and passionate about education. He, He defined it as an evolutionary task force rather than revolutionary back in 2013 with then Governor Otter setting the stage for looking five years in the future and beyond, you know, what does our state need to provide so that our student can be successful in the environment that we're in. 20 recommendations resulted from that good work and we're at the end of that implementation with career ladder and, and, and literacy and some of the other Im- important aspects. So now we fast forward to 2019 and now Governor Brad Little wants us to reevaluate in the, the context of what what's done, what did we get right, what do we need to tweak, where do we need to focus? Um, he has asked that we specifically look at uh, literacy and college and career readiness. At the first meeting, those were the two goals that were kind of unveiled, uh, the improving of literacy and college and career readiness. How do you define those goals maybe more narrowly, and then how will you measure whether you're successful or not in reaching those goals X number of years down the road? These are the questions that we have <laughs> as co-chairs, and that's what we have tasks our uh, subcommittees with. How do we, what metrics do we have in place that will help us understand the current uh, picture? And then what do we do to ensure that what we implement, that we've got good accountability? And and I mean that not in a, um, a punitive sense, but how are we accountable to the the dollars, the funding, the strategies, all of those things? How do we close that loop back uh, so that we know that what we're doing is actually effective? How much carryover do you think there will be from the, the previous task force um, as, as you as you plot out the course for this new task force and how much do you want to carve out new territory for yourselves? I don't know how much carryover there will be because we don't want to replow that field. Mm-hmm. And so we spent some time at the first uh, main meeting, the kickoff meeting, looking at the previous 20 recommendations, but only to provide some context of, as to where we are now. And now we're tasking our subcommittees to say, all right, this is where we were, this is what we know now, understanding that we want to see some huge gains that our governor is very concerned with seeing huge gains in literacy, early literacy particularly, um, and college and career readiness. What does that look like uh, with the conditions that we have now? All right. This probably ties at least to some degree to the literacy goal, but uh, there's extensive research that shows that early childhood education helps students achieve more in the long run. And yet Idaho has been hesitant to kind of increase access to those opportunities. How will you as a task force approach that situation? I think a lot of it comes down to how we, we frame it. Uh, as you pointed out, the, the Constitution or the laws, not the Constitution, but the laws of the state uh, say a parent does not have to send their child to kindergarten, and yet we know that students who come to kindergarten ill-prepared may not ever catch up mm-hmm. to that, you know, that third grade that standard. And so we've talked a lot about readiness defining it in those terms so that we're not, no one wants to take a, a parent's right um, to direct um, education for their child. But we do want to have a conversation about readiness. What does that look like at, at what stages? And then if we can have some good information and good data to support these recommendations, I think we'll, we'll be on a little more of a solid foundation when we go to the legislature to say, this is what we want to do, this is why, and this is how we know it. One of the subcommittees deals with uh, teacher retention, and the state board, as you know, has already done a considerable amount of work in that area with, through the teacher pipeline work group and the ensuing reports. Will those recommendations from the teacher pipeline work group be a, a starting point for this task force? Will you address teacher retention kind of independently? And how do you think we move the needle on teacher retention? 
Those are a lot of questions, yeah. Dave, <laughs> and good questions. First of all, the teacher pipeline report that the full board saw about a year and a half ago-ish, I want to say at this point, will will be used to assist the subcommittee. It's just information provided to them to say, here here is a report. I think since then we've identified some areas that we could do some more investigation and some more work on. This is what we know. This is the foundation. This is where we've been. Um, I think the retention um, is well, I hope that retention will be as important as the recruitment. I, I believe that with the career ladder and with Governor Little's um, investment in you know first year teaching or that first few years of teaching, that we are getting more attention, attracting new, never been in it, you know, never been in education to education folks. The ones that we'd like to see, and as a board, we have had conversations. How does this master educate um, educator premium factor in? It, are we is this something that we want to continue you know does the legislature want to continue to invest in it do we want to do something different with the career ladder these are conversations that i know the governor's office is having as well that retention is equally as important to recruitment which leads me to a question about process because the task force will make recommendations but ultimately it's up to the legislative branch to act upon those right sure. so all the recommendations will go to governor little he wants to see them by november 1st that's the the hard stop uh, for recommendations and then he and his budget folks will go to work looking at what what do they want to include in their budget policy changes um, if there are any those would be run through the state board of education we would then ultimately both of those branches would or the state board and the governor's branch would then go to the legislature um, to get them to do their part we do have um, a significant amount of legislators that are part of mm -hmm. the task force which i think is a great thing it helps all of us understand where we're going and then as we each kind of carry our role through to the finish line, then that helps us be more cohesive in, in the finished product. There's also a strong business presence in the makeup of the task force. How much will that workforce development piece and kind of pro-business agendas drive the outputs of the task force? Oh, I think it's a critical piece. Um, as we know, all the projections for our workforce mm -hmm. in the state are saying that we are not going to have the workers. In fact, we'll be you know, something to the effect of 30 to 40,000 workers shy of, of what the demands are, which isn't to say that we're not meeting needs now for students, mm -hmm. but with technology and, and business changes, we're looking down the road to try to identify what are those things that we need to be prepared for that we can prepare for and that our business people are asking for. How much will you, the task force look at the funding piece of education in terms of the equation of this? Um, in particular, will you address the growing dependence of, of, on local levies that, that the majority now of Idaho school districts have to rely on? I think in two ways. So we've got two separate subcommittees that I believe, one that calls it out specifically, the K-12 budget stability and uh, they'll take a look. We're not interested and we're not going to take the time to go over the ground of the funding formula committee that spent right. three there. This is about budget stability, what needs to happen uh, as far as the, the flow of funds to local districts. Right now we've been in an economic boom. Mm -hmm. We don't know what the future brings. Let's, let's put some recommendations out there to provide that stability. As you've mentioned and touched on, there isn't a school district in the state that isn't impacted by the need for supplemental levies um, or plant facility levies, school bonds, whatever the case may be. So another committee is uh, operations, which is school facilities and safety, and that is something that we've also directed them to have the conversation about. Safety aside, the operational day-to-day -day aspects of school districts, mm -hmm. costs have, has, have increased, um, utilities, fuel, transportation, all of those things have increased just like anyone else's home budget has. How do we keep pace with what needs to happen? You can put on whichever hat you want to, to answer this next question, but how, how much of a role does poverty play when it comes to shortcomings in student achievement and what can we do about it? I think it is the number one indicator, and I don't want to say I think research is telling us in all the reports that we get nationally and within the state that poverty is the number one indicator of success for a student. So knowing that and, and understanding that 70% of our state is also rural, how do we make sure that there is that the consistency that our, our rural um, and not just, well, 
however you want to define underserved, because I think that that can be mm-hmm. poverty. Yeah. It can be um, students of different nationalities, um, our native students, our Hispanic students. Um, frankly, we have high achieving students at times that parents feel that they're underserved. And so we look not only at just poverty, but we also look at mobility students that are moving in and out of districts where they're clustering, how far away they are from um, resources that that larger urban school districts get. Um, So there's there's a lot of moving parts within this machine and there isn't one that gets all of the attention. Um, However, poverty is one that we have identified early on as as being something that we really we we hope to see some good recommendations that way so the task force will address it and have some kind of potential solutions i'm hoping there we haven't um as co-chairs we haven't said we've said here are the the four subcommittees as um informed by what the governor would like Mm -hmm. us to look at we haven't said make sure you talk about but i don't know how you don't talk about that right Let's talk about uh, your other role now as president of the Idaho State Board of Education. How significant is that for you personally, given your background in school board work and with your own children attending Idaho public schools? Um, well, it's uh, it's a daunting <laughs> uh, thought, and so I got to think about this almost two months into it. And um, I've been on the board for nearly five years, so I'm one year into my second term. It's taken me, the learning curve is, is huge. Um, there, there's awesome people that work on the board that are dedicated, and I feel like, you know, there's, there's a lot of support. There are things that, um, as a, a board member, that I, I hope to bring to the attention to other board members' attention. You know, as the president, you're able to um, take issues or concerns, or maybe we need to talk about that. It, it's an avenue for me to say, let's take some time to talk about X, Y, and Z. What are some of the things that would be incorporated in in your vision that you want to accomplish sure. during your term? One of one of them um, is is an operational thing, but taking a, a look at our meeting structures and the board subcommittees, are they meeting the needs of the conversations that we're having now? We spend a lot of time talking about a handful of things. Um, is the, the the structure and the process that we have suiting our needs well? And and are we making the most efficient use of our time at our meetings and, and leaving space for discussion rather than everything being um, decisions that need to be made about coaching contracts or you know some of these other things that are important. Um, however, are they the most critical? Um, another area that I'm very passionate about is social emotional learning and how we address that better in our state. We know from um, kindergarten to postgraduate education, if you're a college president, if you're a principal, if you're a teacher, if you're a parent, that we're dealing with students who have emotional needs that whether they're greater than they were 10 years ago, I don't know. I just think we're, we feel more comfortable talking about them and there's more expectation that schools be able to handle that. And I, I look at it also from the safety side of things. There's only so many locks that you can put on doors. Let's look at the preventative side. If we can take care of an issue in kindergarten, first, second grade, we're not pushing it onto the junior high or high school. And then, you know, you get to college and our college presidents are saying, this is killing us. We have so many students that, that need emotional support. We don't take care of it at college. Then it becomes an employer's problem. And so um, whether it's my boyfriend broke up with me and I'm having a hard time dealing with it or I can't get out of bed to go to school, every level in there, I think, um, some more attention and figuring out how to channel the resources that we have. This isn't about taking money from somewhere else, but what are some ways that we have within our K-12 system, within our college system, that we can better support teachers, families, students? But data tells us that Idaho's ratio of counselors to, to students is is well below or above, depending on how, how you look at it. But um, not reaching the nationally recommended goals. How do we address mental health? How do we address nutrition and some of those other pieces of de- child development that maybe fall outside of the typical academic subjects? Yeah, we're hundreds of students over um, what's the recommendation from you know the National mm-hmm. Counseling Association. Um, one of the issues that we've identified is that particularly at the elementary level, if they do have a full-time counselor, there are some elementary schools share with other schools that those um, individuals are working um, bus duty and you know so in these times when students might access 
um, our counselors are, you know, filling some of these roles that, and I think it, we trace it back to 2008 when we had, you know, Idaho went into a recession and mm-hmm. schools were forced to make cuts. You have folks wearing all sorts of hats and, and that's just how it is in public education. Um, in some areas, we need to take some of those, those hats off. Um, I think having more um, open conversations about it, training parents. I think we have opportunities. Schools have access to information and um, training that could help parents better understand how to deal with a child. Um, suicide rates. I mean, heaven forbid, we don't mm-hmm. we don't want one more child in the state of Idaho uh, to feel that 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 is what makes them feel better. You know, put put me anyway. Uh, we've got opportunities around the state and with in schools to provide teachers with skills that they can also help um, assist what's happening with counselors. How do we help parents? Ultimately, I mean, we're about student achievement, right? We want kids Mm -hmm. to do well. We want kids to be able to fulfill their career goals. If we can't get kids, we've got to get that emotional side before we can get the academic side. Let's go back to the operational piece that you alluded to earlier. Walk us through, how does the state board work in concert with the State Department of Education, stakeholder groups like the IEA and elected officials? How does, it, how does it work now and how could we do it better? We have the beauty of having um, one system. You have one board, the State Board of Education, that oversees um, all of the governance and policies of education in Idaho, kindergarten to postgraduate medical um, education. And the State Department is an agency to the board Uh, Career technical education is an agency to the board. Idaho Public TV is an agency to the board. And so you have the state superintendent who sits as a board member. um, So she's uh, one of eight. um, And so she is actively uh, uh, participating in the policy and the whatever goals initiatives happen at the board level and then from there as the state superintendent the department of education is there to implement and execute the policies of the full board we have to work and we don't work in in isolation or in silos we have to work with our stakeholders what are our teachers saying what are our school administrators saying what are our local school boards dealing with and how do their needs um, how, how does that get reflected in in the discussions and the decisions that we make going back to the task force for one one final question as you work through your meetings and ultimately develop recommendations that you'll pass along to to the governor do you get the sense that there's support for change and that there's political will to get the things done that, that the task force will recommend I think so. I think we know that education, you, you don't have to do a statewide poll to know that education is a number one on, on people's mind. Um, we, we invest a lot of money within our state. More than half of our budget, our revenues go towards education. I think we're to a point where we say, you know what, we've been collecting a lot of data. We've been doing a lot of new things, so to speak, over the last couple of years. It, are we getting the return on the investment? And the, the motivation is to make sure that we're being the most prudent with the, in the allocations that we have and the money that we expend. Are we best supporting teachers so that they can get their job done? If, if we're not doing those things, then we need to reexamine and say, what, what barriers are there? Or why isn't this working that a teacher is not able to be the most effective in the classroom? Because, and I'm not saying this because of the audience, but that's where the learning takes place. Mm-hmm. Debbie, best of luck with the task force. And I know it's, a, a, as you said, somewhat of a daunting task, and you've got a large group to, to, to corral. Thanks, uh, thanks for joining us here on this IEA Reporter Podcast. Thank you. Hopefully you'll have me back when we get into the task force a little more. You can throw some arrows at me. <laughs> I would love to do that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.